Welcome everybody, and it's uh, we're back. Uh, it's May twenty second, twenty twenty four, and we're back for another photo PXL photo chats, or as Jeff would call it, photo PXL, or some way he manages to screw up my company. Pixel. Pixel. So uh, we're very proud today. I like have... a French pixel. Okay, a French pixel is what we. <laughs> That's one way to put it. So uh, we're we're really happy today to have uh, Rad Drew as a guest. We'll introduce him in a second. Uh, I just want to tell you what's coming up here. On June 5th, we've got Hugh Brownstone on street photography. Uh, the 19th, Alan Ross, who was uh, an assistant to um, Ansel Adams. Uh, we're having a hard time getting somebody for the 3rd of July just because it's holiday weekend, but I, have, I think might have somebody. Uh, if not, we just might take a holiday uh, there, since it's the 4th of July holiday weekend uh, uh, coming up there, but uh, I'll let you know that in future articles and announcements. And then on the 17th, we have Suzanne Mathias. So we're looking forward to having her as a guest and uh, it's always good. As usual, your your host today are, are Jeff Shiwi, uh, myself, Kevin Raber, John Cornicello, who is the Hello. founder and originator of this uh, photo chats. And Holger Mischke, which I, I don't see Holger online here, but uh, uh, from Germany, he did a great program last week. If you haven't seen that, uh, the recording is up on my site at photopxl.com, and you can go up and uh, download it so you can watch it. Um, done, done some amazing photography, black and white work, and uh, it was just great to listen to what his program is. He's a lot different. He's not all into the latest camera gear and things like that, so it's pretty cool. Um, I have a couple workshops coming up. Uh, I just always want to make sure you know my workshops. Uh, I've got one opening on my last Palouse workshop on the 24th to the 29th. An amazing time. I only take five people with me on that trip. So um, if you want to have a, uh, and see the Palouse the way it should well, be seen, then that's uh, a workshop that you should consider. I also have one spot opened up because we changed ships and now I have an extra spot on the ship. Uh, for Greenland in August 13th to the 22nd. Uh, we're going to go be visiting a really cool feared system that uh, n has no restrictions, has a lot of really cool places we can land and a lot of great icebergs and uh, it's just going to be a magnificent trip. So really looking forward to that. And we've got a badass ship. There's only 12 of us on it, plus the, the crew and uh, the, the guides. But um, that one's uh, going to be on uh, in August. And we have a five, fine art printing workshop coming up next weekend. Um, you can always join that still if you want. Call me if that's what you'd like. And then we have another fine art printing workshop in October. And uh, they're always a lot of fun and a great chance to learn how to make big prints and a lot of prints and um, fine tune your printing skills. Uh, in a minute, well, we're going to mute everybody. Uh, and then the only person that will be unmuted will be our speaker, Rad Drew. He'll unmute himself. And then uh, we will then unmute everybody at the end, or you, if you have questions, uh, you can be unmuting yourself. Please use the chat section to uh, ask any questions that you have as we go through the presentation. John will, as he sees fit, either interrupt Rad or hold him to the very end, where you'll be able to ask your questions personally. And afterwards, we'll stay online for some just general uh, BS and you know fun get together stuff before we close off the meeting. Today's uh, guest is Rad Drew. Um, he's going to be talking about the age of the iPhone and um, having just done a, a workshop, I can't believe how many images I actually shot with the iPhone as well as my Fuji system. Um, the iPhone has really have come to age and there's nobody in my opinion that knows the iPhone better than, than Rad. Rad happens to be from Indianapolis here. He's a good friend. We go out shooting, and we always seem to have an adventure when we go shooting, especially on our last trip. On, we came across an unfortunate fatal accident. We were one of the first on the scene. Uh, but, you know, we ended up with some great pictures and a great time uh, even after that was all through. And uh, just Rad explores everything from infrared to all sorts of cool apps and really has done some masterpieces with the iPhone and uh, in my opinion, he's probably the, the best there is at showing uh, exactly why we might have to say it's the iPhone. It should be really the eye camera with a phone attached to it. <laughs> so uh, it's it's a great time. So um, I am now going to turn this over to Rad. So let me just stop my sharing so Rad can get on board. Welcome, Rad. It's all yours, my friend. 
Thank and, you, Kevin. Uh, let me put everybody on mute for a second. Hang on. Mute all. And Rad, you might have to um, unmute yourself. So double check your, your mute thing and your microphone thing as soon as I hit this button. Here you go. Okay. You should still be able to hear me, right? Yep. Okay. Well, thanks for that introduction, Kevin. I appreciate that. I, I don't know if I know all that or not, but I've been doing this for a long time with the iPhone. I, I mean, like, like most of you, I've been a photographer forever. Um, but um, the iPhone's been in my life since um, uh, my first one was in uh, 2009. And I, was, I got an iPhone 4. And I was buying a phone. I had no idea it had a camera in it. Um, so that was quite the revelation for me. Um, and, um, you know, it came at a time um, when I still had a day job and I was working uh, in a corporate setting. This was 2009. And I was spending my day at the computer. And the last thing I wanted to do is come home and sit at the computer some more to, it, it, looking at Photoshop or whatever. And so when the phone came along, you know, it really freed me up. So I, I'm going to be sharing with you some of the things that I've learned kind of grow, watching it grow up over the years and um, become the incredible camera that it is today. Um, I'm going to make sure that you guys have access to these slides. I'll be sending Kevin a link as soon as we finish today. Um, and in it, you'll find uh, links to resources. Here's my contact information. Uh, you, if you have any questions about anything we talk about today, I hope you'll email me. Um, visit my website. I've got a new Slick Pick website that's made for photographers, and I'm, I just got it started in January, and I'm I'm having fun with it. Um, it's it's been fun to to have that kind of site. Um, I do a newsletter about once a month, and I try and share things that I've I've learned or that I'm working on. Uh, you can check my workshop schedule and I'm out on Instagram and Facebook as well. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm here in Indianapolis. I'm a dad. I'm a grandfather. I have a three-year-old granddaughter. My uh, my kids won't let me show pictures of her on uh, social media. So you'll just have to take my word for it. She's, uh, she's adorable. Um, I'm married to Nancy Lee. Um, and Nancy is a jeweler and a metalsmith here in Indianapolis and just a tremendous artist. Um, and I've, I've got a link here if you ever want to check out the kinds of things that she does. She's an inspiration to me every day with the uh, creations that she that she does. Um, and so I hope to take a look at those. I enjoy creative writing um, about as much as as photography. Um, I got my start in journalism and um, literally one of my editors threw a camera to me across the room one day and said, get some pictures with that story. Um, and that was really my beginning um, uh, to, of, of doing photography as a as a career as a professional. And I I did I got a BA in journalism from Indiana University, and I worked as a journalist uh, for a couple of years. And then I went back and got my master's in education, and I left professional photography um, for the corporate world. And I spent about thirty years here at Eli Lilly at, in Indianapolis, and photography wasn't part of my job. But I was never far away from a camera. And um, so I continued doing photography for my, myself. But then in 2010, I started this business and I haven't looked back. Um, I've had the, the best run for the past uh, 14 years. I've had the opportunity to travel uh, different places around the world um, and uh, lead groups, uh, photographers. And I share what I know, um, whether it's uh, inf infrared photography with a big camera or uh, iPhone or desktop processing things uh, in the way that I do them. So um, it's just been a lot of fun. And like many of you, I consider myself a passionate creator. I love being out in the field with whatever camera I have, whether I'm by myself or with a group of people. Uh, Kevin and I go out all the time here in Indiana. I love photographing in my in my own backyard when I'm not traveling. And, um, and then I like working with these images in the digital darkroom. So what I, what I wanna talk about today, um, you know, we've watched this phone go from being kind of a novelty to a really viable um, tool in our in our camera bag for many of us. And, you know, I, as I take groups around uh, different places, I, I just came back from Tuscany and I had three people on my trip and they only photographed with their iPhone. Um, and so yeah, I'm seeing that more and more. And honestly, there are so many things you can do with it. I certainly understand why. So what, what I want to do is just kind of go through some of the 
the settings and controls of the new phone and some of the features that I use that I that I love uh, for for creative uh, interpretation of images, um, things like live mode and portrait mode and burst mode. These are things you're probably familiar with, but maybe I'll introduce something new that you haven't uh, haven't just have stumbled onto yet. Um, and then I'll do a quick inf uh, intro to infrared photography with the phone. I love infrared photography. I've been doing it since film days. Uh, I have several big cameras converted to uh, infrared, but about the iPhone 11, that was what, four or five years ago, I started exploring doing this with the iPhone and I'm having a blast with it. And it's, um, I'm producing some images that are, I mean, I, I'd be happy to have made them with any camera. And the fact that I'm making them with an iPhone just really excites me. Um, so uh, before I start with this, I really, and you guys, I'm preaching to the choir here, I'm sure you're all seasoned veterans. It's really not about the camera. Um, you know, these cameras are so sophisticated today, but whatever phone you have, whatever camera you have, you can still do a lot of stuff. I mean, you know, Kevin talks about uh, photographers, you know, having gas, gear acquisition syndrome. Um, we all want the latest tech, the shiniest new gadget, the most megapixels and all that. But none of those things alone are going to make our, photog our photographs better. I mean, it's, it's what we do with uh, what we put in the frame, how we arrange it, how we compose. And the technology is there and what it produces, provides us with some options. Um, but regardless of the phone you have, you can do an awful lot with it. When I first got that uh, first iPhone 4 in 2009, it really freed me up. It was a, it, it really symbolized freedom for me. It took me away from having to be tied to the desktop. I didn't have to carry loads of gear around. Um, I, I had a camera with me all the time. And I could process on the device, which was was pretty cool. And and at the time, Facebook was just starting to get traction, and so you could share things immediately with uh, different groups or uh, people you were working with. Um, and you can experiment in the moment, try something. If it doesn't work, try something else. Change your format, change your composition, change your light. Um, and then I also loved how unobtrusive I could be with the iPhone. I could go into places and make photographs. Um, that I probably couldn't make with my big camera. And then I have, uh, and I enjoy that, uh, uh, you know, being able to do that. Um, it also freed me from having to think about the technicalities of photography. Now, some of you might be thinking that's sacrilege to say that. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm a big camera photographer. I, I understand the uh, exposure triangle. And I believe that understanding all those things are important. But what's nice about the phone is, if I don't want to, I don't have to think about it. The phone will do so many of these things for me and do them so well that I can let myself, you know, not think about focal length, shutter speed, aperture, all that. I can think about what I'm putting in the frame, how I'm composing. If I'm doing a portrait, I can work on my relationship with that subject and, and often yield a different kind of image because I'm not attending to settings. Now, if I want to, we can always find a camera app out there that lets us take control. And there are times when I do, but much of the time I use the native camera in the iPhone um, for uh, for what I photograph. Um, the thing too that, that I, I'm blown away by with today's camera is that there are so many different types of photography we can do. I did a workshop last fall in Cape Cod and we were finishing up and I had eight people on the beach and, you know, we'd been learning new stuff all week. And we had one guy over on, had a camera on a tripod doing a long exposure infrared photo photograph. We had someone else doing macro photos of beach flowers blooming. We had someone else doing portraits of people walking their pets on the beach. Um, someone else, we, one of the women had her camera in a, in a bag underwater photographing a crab. I mean... And it hit me, you know, I'm looking at all of these people, everybody's doing a different kind of photography and we're all using the same device. I mean, it was really an epiphany. And, you know, when you think about it, if you're, if you're doing that with a big camera, you're going to have multiple lenses, you're going to have neutral density filters. It's, it's a whole different experience. Um, and so as I get older, I'm 70, as I get older, I really uh, appreciate being able to travel light when I want to. Um, so, all of these different kinds of things, you know, macro photography, uh, this is a photo of Poppy last uh, two weeks ago in, uh, in Tuscany, um, that we have a portrait mode. The, 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 um, the 7 Plus was the first to introduce that 
portrait mode on the iPhone that lets us get a shallow depth of field where you can focus on a subject, but let that background just drift off into that beautiful soft bouquet behind the subject. And it's for not only for portraits, but for any subject that you want to isolate and present. Um, and that portrait mode that was introduced on the 7 Plus has just gotten better with each iPhone that came out. We also have the ability to change lenses pretty much at will. With the 15, I have six different lenses, focal lengths that I can choose from 13 millimeter ultra wide, which is what this image is, all the way to 120 millimeter. Um, and you know, I don't have to worry about changing lenses or carrying extra lenses. I simply hit a button and I'm in that other mode. And it just opens up all kinds of options uh, for, for creative expression. Um, panoramas are incredibly easy with the iPhone. Um, the top one was made in Tuscany last week. We were treated to an incredible sunrise with fog and just changing uh, conditions. Uh, the one on the bottom was made in 2019 with an earlier iPhone, and I've stylized it and played with it a little bit. But I love doing these um, these panoramas. This is one that was made in, um, this is the uh, Alicia Alonso Grand Ballroom in Cuba, where I go to photograph dancers with the Cuban National Ballet. And I love being able to do a panorama of an interior like this. And this is a pristine, I mean, it, it's really clean, a clean photo. Um, it, it will tolerate being printed um, really large, which is something Kevin's really good at. Um, and you'll, you, his workshop, I've seen him print some of the biggest uh, prints from iPhones that I've ever seen. Um, we can do long exposures with the camera. This is, we don't need a tripod. We don't need a neutral density filter. Using live mode, you can produce a long exposure handheld um, with our cameras. And this is with a, an earlier iPhone, probably the 10S from several years ago. And I'm, I'm posting some of these earlier images because I really wanna show that the, the latest phone is great, but you don't really need to have the latest phone to do some really creative work. Um, we also now have this ability to, to do night photography and low light photography. Um, I think it was with the 12 that they introduced um, night mode. And night, night mode um, is, I mean, it's a technological kind of wonder here. So when you do night photography, um, night mode activates when you're in a dark setting and it'll photograph It'll, it'll make photographs for periods of time anywhere from one second up to 30 seconds. You can handhold up to 10 seconds. And after that, if you put it on a tripod and it's dark enough, you can get a 30 second period. Notice I'm not saying a 30 second exposure. It's really not a 30 second exposure. Like our big cameras where we set the, 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 you know, the, the time for 30 seconds, the shutter stays open for that whole time and you know, it, it's collecting the light. In this case, it's a period of time that the camera shoots and it's taking lots of short little photos, probably with a high ISO that it's automatically setting. Well, when you shoot with a high ISO, as you know, you're gonna introduce noise into the image. What happens with night photography, the longer you're shooting, the period is, the more photographs that it takes during that period. The noise that appears on each photo is random. It appears in a different place on every photo. And then using computational photography, without you even knowing it, it's stacking all those images together and the noise disappears. So you get an image like this one of the uh, Alicia Alonso Grand Ballroom in Cuba that's really clean um, without noise present. Um, last week, oh, sorry, I jumped ahead to, I was thinking of another thing. We'll talk about that in a second. It's also, I've also been experimenting with um, photographing the night sky. And we'll look at that in a second. So here we have with this new phone, this is the week I got my 15 Pro last week or last year, I went out and I photographed in my neighborhood. I can go from a 13 millimeter all the way to 120 millimeter just by pressing a button. And the, the, the 24 millimeter, that's your 1X main camera. You tap on that, you can go to 28 millimeter, tap on that, you go to 35. The 2X gives you 48 and 5X on the uh, uh, Pro Max gives you 120. I mean, to be able to change your, your focal length like that just by tapping a button is, is just tremendous um, and convenient. So portrait mode, I mentioned before that it's been around since the iPhone 7. 
I think it was one of the the coolest inter, intervent, uh, introductions of a new new technology since the phone came out. Um, it allows us to take a photograph where we focus on a subject and have a shallow depth of field, and then we can dial in that background blur, to, you know, that bouquet behind the subject to the extent that we want. Um, it started out very good with seven plus, and it's gotten better with each new phone to the point now where with the 15, it creates a depth map of that subject. And you can actually change the focal point after the photo has been made by tapping a different area of the image. And we'll look at that in a minute. Um, this was made with the 10S, just to give you an idea that it doesn't take the latest cameras, uh, a farmer in Cuba uh, making charcoal. And you know, was able to focus on his fascinating face and those eyes, but then leave some of that background there for context. Um, this was also made with the 10S. And this is a, a, a flower vendor in Havana. And, um, you know, one of the things you can do after you've made the photo when you're editing in the portrait mode editor is to cho choose different light options. And one of them is called stage light and it drops the background out completely and leaves you with the subject only, very figural in the frame. Um, it's just a really fun way, I think, of presenting a variety of subjects, not just people, but any object uh, that you want to isolate. Um, this photograph was made the week I got my 15 Pro Max last fall, and I think it epitomizes what this camera is capable of. This is a portrait mode photo, so these are, um, what, are what are those called? Um, sweet, sweet gum? I forget what they're called. Uh, but these leaves, the, the focal plane that these leaves are on here and this one, all of that is sharp. But I, I dialed in a softer background to give this almost a three-dimensional um, uh, feel. And, and I think, you know, this is part of what I love about the phone. You can get this clarity um, and still have this depth um, that, that you can control when you're when you're editing. Um, this is a, a, a dancer that I photographed in February and I've, this is a little bit larger than the actual photo, but I wanted to show you, you know, you, you can get the, the, the face very sharp and then dial in this background. And then the, what's really fun when you're editing, when you're doing the editing with the portrait editor, you can do the photo like this, but you can also go to stage light and there's a high key option that drops the background and leaves everything white. But there's, or you can do a black and white with the background uh, dark. I mean, all of these different options just open up different creative avenues for us to present our, our images and tell whatever story we're trying to tell with our camera. Um, this was made with the 15 Pro Max last week in Tuscany. And I focused on the iris in the foreground, but I left, you know, I blurred the background. These are um, uh, cypress trees along the drive at the place we stayed at. Um, and in processing it, um, I dialed in the background to be soft, but here's where it gets really almost freaky. You take this photo and then when you're in the editor, if I wanted, I could tap right here and switch that focal point to this part of the image. Uh, it's, it's because the depth map is created and all I'm doing is relocating that focal point. It's really, it's really pretty cool to be able to do that. Um, so here's what I'm talking about. This photo, I actually played with Barbies one day in a presentation I did recently. And my wife has quite a collection. And so this photo was made with the portrait mode. And in the editing mode, I tapped on the, the doll in the foreground and she's in focus. Then I tapped on the doll in the, in the center, and now she's in focus and the other two are soft. Then I tapped on the one in the, in the background and she's in focus and the other. So it, using that depth map now, it, it can, you can change the focal point of the image after you've made the photo. Um, this is a, a, a use of the portrait mode that I think I'm exploring more and more. Um, we were in a lot of churches in Italy and they're, they're magnificent. I mean, they're just beautiful uh, structures. They're old and, and a lot of art, but trying to find interesting ways of, of presenting those to a viewer, uh, it's, it's challenging. So in this case, I went in with the portrait mode. I focused on the votive candles here and then let the background go just a little soft, still keeping that context. 
And I just think it's a it's a great way of of telling the story of that environment. And this is all possible now with this technology in our pocket. Um, in the 13, when it came out, they introduced um, something called macro control. And macro control allows you to put a button on your camera interface that lets you toggle macro on and off. So you can toggle on and photograph close, turn it off and not photograph close. You have to set it up in your settings and we'll look at that in a minute. But these are two, um, this was done with the 13, the year it came out, for the first year it came out. This was done with the 15 Pro Max more recently um, using that macro control. And there's a blog post that I wrote, you can click on this and I, I give a little more detail about how this work and how to set it up. But really, I mean, that's phenomenal. I'd be happy to have made that with any camera and to have made it with the iPhone is kind of mind blowing. Um, these are just a couple others. Um, this one was with an earlier phone. These two are with the 15 Pro Max um, and just fun to get close to those subjects. Um, one of the other um, tools with the phone that's been around for a long time is live mode. If uh, You might have had the same experience as I did when it first came out. I would open my camera roll and I'd see images and they'd move and I'd, I'd do a double take, like what just happened? Well, I didn't really fully understand live mode at the time. And so I was inadvertently making live mode photos that were moving when I opened them up. Well, what this tool does is let you, it's a great way to do a simulated long exposure um, where you're able to get something like this water that's moving uh, go soft while everything else remains sharp. This was in Calabria last October, the southern part of Italy. And this is handheld um, live mode. Um, I get that soft water and everything else is, is sharp. And again, no neutral density filter and no tripod. Um, and that was with the 14 uh, Pro Max. This was an earlier phone. I'm on my way to the Smokies and I stopped at the Cumberland Falls in Kentucky. And I wanted to, I didn't get all my gear out. I just walked down the, the path with my phone because uh, I was on the road. You know, I was in a hurry to get to where I was going. And I went down and I made this photo, handheld, live mode. I mean, that's just amazing to me that the technology allows us to, to do that. Um, once I got the Smokies, this is with the 12 Pro Max, uh, live mode of, the, of a stream there. Um, so that is a, another tool that I really enjoy using. And we'll look at a little bit of how I do that. We're also getting an opportunity to do these better low light photos. And so what I was talking about before, the way that works, you know, it, it's going to take, shoot a lot of different photographs during a period of time and then stack those together and virtually eliminate the noise. Um, and I, I did my first um, foray into star photography. This was in um, Tuscany last two weeks ago. I went out after dinner, it was dark. And I learned a couple of things. I, I had my phone on a tripod um, and I was, so it, it gave me a 30 second period of, of shooting time. And notice the ambient light down here. What I found was there's a village over there or something. And I found that if I went to the, the exposure dial and dropped down two stops, I could eliminate a whole bunch of ambient noise in here that was preventing me from seeing the sky. When I dropped that down two stops, my sky went pretty much black and I was able to get um, these, these stars. I mean, there's even a, a, a shooting star up here in the upper right. I'm really eager to, to explore this a little bit more when we're in the Palouse uh, over the next couple of weeks uh, where we'll have some really dark skies. Um, the other thing that I've been doing since 2011, as I mentioned, is infrared. Um, I love the look of infrared and I'm excited that it can now be achieved with the iPhone. Um, I'll show you a few examples of that. This is a photograph done uh, down near Atlanta, um, near Roswell, uh, Georgia. Um, this is with an app called Camera Plus Pro Camera and Editor. It's on a tripod. It's a 30-second shooting period. Um, and I, I, again, this is a photograph I'd be happy to have made with any camera. Um, your, your foliage turns white, uh, green foliage. You, your blue skies turn black. Um, it's just a, a really fun way of presenting a scene. Um, this was made with the 15 Pro Max. That was this winter. So even though, and this is with the 5X, the 120 millimeter lens, even with, um, this was 
without a lot of foliage that turns green when you're shooting infrared. I love the tone of this black and white and what's uh, what's achievable. And I'm, I'm eager to, to play with that more now that we've got uh, a lot more greenery this time of year. Um, I did I do find that with the with 120 millimeter lens, I do like to have the camera on a tripod for that. You can hand hold it, but because it's such a long lens, any motion at all is going to give you a soft image uh, sometimes. So I do often put this on a tripod or make, um, you know, extreme efforts to brace myself against a tree or something. Um, this photo was made with the 12 Pro Max. This is uh, Magnolia Plantation Gardens in the Carolinas. Um, native camera with night mode activated and handheld, processed in Lightroom uh, Mobile, uh, which I think is one of the best options we have for processing raw files on the phone. Um, and again, it's another example of a photo. I would be happy if I'd made this with my Fuji. Uh, the detail, the clarity, uh, the quality of the image is, um, it rivals that of what I get with the big camera. This is out on Cape Cod, another um, Camera Plus Pro Camera and Editor, 30 seconds on a tripod. Um, and these are photographs that I made last fall, right after I got the 15 Pro. Even though there are no, um, there's no greenery to turn white, I still like the tonality that I get when I when I use an infrared filter on the phone. This is a 720 nanometer, um, and I just like the tonality and the quality of that black and white. Um, this was a, another long exposure. This is a day Kevin and I were out um, in Southern Indiana about a year ago, and the clouds were rapidly moving across the sky. So a long exposure gave me those meteor-like uh, uh, cloud movements that I really, really like. So that's those are some examples of, uh, of infrared that's possible. Um, the rest of these things, there's a lot of resources listed here. If you're interested in this, um, you can go through these when you get the slides. These are links to the, the filters, the mounts, and the things like that. And there are a variety of different ones. There's some different options. Um, but you need, you need a way to attach your filter to the camera. And this is one of them. Um, there's another one uh, that is this magnetic option, which is more recent and I really like because it's so convenient. You just pop it on, take your photo, pop it off, and you can photograph non-infrared. Um, 720 nanometer filter and a little step up ring that fits to this. So anyway, you can explore this. All of these links here will take you out to where you can find those resources. Um, you may need to have a tripod for some of these uh, long exposure photos. Um, and if you're if you have a big camera tripod, I that's what I use for my iPhone. But if you're only doing iPhone photography, you don't need to have a heavy duty um, uh, tripod, you need one sturdy, but you don't need something stable enough to hold your big camera. Um, and so these are a couple of ones um, that um, that I've that I've used or that I've seen. And Kevin did a great video on this one. I, I think there's a link to his video in here somewhere. Um, and then you also need a bracket to hold your phone on the tripod. And these are ones, uh, this Monfrotto is one that I like, and there's a little release plate you get with it. And then this was, is another one that I find really, uh, really good. Um, and the rest of this stuff, uh, two tro pocket tripods, believe it or not, I use these a lot uh, when I don't want to carry a tripod. It, they work. I've used them in Cuba along the Malacone where there's a wall and I set this little tripod on the wall. Very cool. Um, so those are some th resources you can explore on your own. I do want to just say a word about raw and i i know all of you are seasoned photographers and you you probably shoot raw with your big camera i'm certain well we now have the ability to shoot pro raw with the iphone um, and there are other apps like lightroom uh, mobile and so on that have cameras that allow us to create in raw even if we have an earlier iphone i encourage you to look at that with the phone i mean it's going to you know the, the raw file um, contains all the data that the sensor sees and it doesn't compress it Basically, what that means is you get to make the decisions about how your image is going to look rather than the computer making it for you. So it gives you more creative control, I think. And you can often recover details in highlights or shadows that might be lost in a compressed uh, JPEG file. Um, if you print, 
I encourage you to print, um, you know, work with raw files um, to create your images and then print from there. Raw files do require some processing. They don't come out of the camera looking fairly good like a JPEG will. They need some massaging, um, but it's worth it. And um, there, you can use the iOS editor in the phone. You can use Lightroom Mobile on your phone, or you can take these raw files directly to your uh, desktop. Kevin and I were talking about this yesterday. He showed me his technique for taking his iPhone raw files directly into Lightroom Classic, where he can work with them there. So um, I do encourage you, you know, encourage you to check that out. If you haven't been exploring raw on your phone, we now have that option. The rest of these slides, um, what I've done, we've all got different phones, possibly. And I've gone through and looked at the 10, 10S, and the, all the way through to the 15 Pro, and I've created some screenshots of the settings that I recommend. And I'm just gonna skip through these real quick. You can look at these, look up your phone and um, and see what settings I recommend. Um, and again, I hope you'll subscribe to my newsletter, check out my link tree. I've got videos on my YouTube channel on how to do a variety of different things. Um, uh, if you're interested in infrared photography, I have a Facebook group. We've got about 1500 people out there now creating nothing but iPhone infrared. There's a wide range of, of work there. There's some seasoned veterans that are in producing some amazing work. There are some newbies that are learning, uh, but it's a great place to be inspired and see what others are doing. Uh, and then there's a blog post that I've about a little bit more about infrared. I do want to mention another desktop product that I use every day called uh, Topaz's uh, Photo AI. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, but it's a really great tool for reducing noise, sharpening, and increasing resolution, which can be useful when you're working with a smaller, sometimes smaller iPhone image, or if it's been aggressively cropped. You can increase the resolution with integrity. Um, and just to, you know, um, just to be clear, I, I'm, a, I'm an associate rep for them. So uh, I've been for almost seven or eight years. Um, so if you do buy something from them after clicking this link. I earn a commission. So just be aware of that full disclosure. Uh, but I use this software every, almost every day. Um, and we are finding some new options now in Lightroom where, uh, for noise reduction and things that are rivaling some of these, but I still like Topaz for increasing resolution. Um, these are some other tripod suggestions rather than name tripods that I would tell you to get. Uh, you've got different preferences for what kind of tripod you like and what money you want to spend. These are some of the companies that I've used and I respect their stuff. This is the link to the video that Kevin did on this uh, Peak Design tripod. It gives you a really good look at, at that tripod. So those are some that, that I'd recommend. Uh, there's a link to my cover article in the PSA Journal in January where I, uh, I spoke about uh, iPhone photography. You can check that out. And then before we move to the phone, I just want to let you know if you're local, and I don't know if we have anybody local here or not, but maybe someone who looks at the video uh, in the next you know, week or so, I have two local events that I'm doing on June 26th. Uh, I was invited to speak at the Anderson Public Library uh, by the Kilbuck Photography Guild uh, of Anderson, and I'm doing a free presentation there from 6 to 7.30, where I'll be demonstrating different iPhone techniques uh, and processing uh, things. And then since I'm going to be up there for that evening, I'm hosting a walkabout Anderson. Anderson is an incredibly beautiful downtown uh, historic district. Um, and what we'll do is walk around. I'll teach different techniques with the phone and we'll photograph some amazing uh, locations, including uh, the Paramount Theater, which is a, it's a beautifully restored atmospheric theater. It's one of only 12 left in the country. And it, it's truly beautiful. I got to photograph it last week and um, it, it's uh, we'll be able to photograph inside. And so there's details and registration there. And you can look at all this stuff. So that that's kind of my my slide spiel. And I'll get these slides to you and um, hopefully you'll find some of those links uh, will be useful um, for research. And so what I want to do now is switch over and share my uh, my iPhone. And while I'm getting this set up, I don't know, um, John, if there are any questions or anything. I had one question from Jill. Um, Jill, do you yeah. want to ask that yourself or do you want me to ask that for you? you just asking about what apps you use and books to recommend. 
What I'm sorry, what apps I use and well, what books. where she started out by saying she hasn't touched a camera besides analog in a long time. Said she just yes, she doesn't really need a digital camera now. She just uses the iPhone. And then asked what apps you use and what books you recommend. Um, well, books, I can't really say. You know, the thing about books is um there are several that have been written over the years, but they become obsolete so quickly or they don't contain, you know, the latest stuff. Um I think they're probably um I don't know. Dan Burkholder's written a great book on creating with the iPhone. Um, oddly, Scott Kelby has done some uh, some things with the uh, with a book on the iPhone. But again, a lot of that it's not current um, uh, that I'm aware of. So you have to watch for that. As far as apps um, for for camera apps these days, um, one of the main things that I use today is the iPhone native camera. And you know. Um, Nobody used to use the iPhone camera. When the iPhone first came out, nobody used that camera. We all got different camera apps um, that we that we used and um and instead. But now that iPhone native camera is tremendous. And that's what we're going to look at here. Um other apps that I, I like, um Lightroom Mobile for the iPhone, if you like to process on your phone. I don't think there's a better raw editor available to us for the phone. Um, you can take your photos uh, to your desktop, as I mentioned, and process them with whatever raw processor you like, whether it's you know Lightroom or uh, Adobe Camera Raw or uh, uh, photo Photoshop, whatever. But um, I like to process on my phone. It's very mobile, um, and so Lightroom Mobile is awesome for that. Snapseed, this app right here has been around for a long time. It, Snapseed was created by the people who made Nick software. So it's really well engineered software. Google bought it from them years ago. It's a free app. It's, it works on iPhone and Android. Um, and it's a very sophisticated tool that lets you do a lot of different things. Um, it has a raw processor, but I don't like it. So I, I have some workarounds for how I work with raw files uh, and process them elsewhere before taking them into Snapseed. But those are two of the, the, the apps that I really like. And then for stylizing, if you like to stylize your photos and add um, effects and textures and things like that, there are a host of different apps. Um, uh, uh, Distressed FX, which is, that's, that's the one that Kevin gets his birds from. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, it's a really cool app. Lots of things you can do. Uh, with that, um, and there are just a host of others. Dramatic black and white is tremendous for doing um, black and white photography um, or, or, or processing images to be black and white. It's like almost like you can sculpt the light with this tool, and it's it's amazing. Um, I don't know who what asked the question, but if Camera Pro Plus or something like that for your I, infrared? I'm sorry? What did you mention for the infrared camera pro? Oh plus yeah. So the infrared, uh, there's an app called camera plus pro camera and editor. Um, and it's, it's a remarkable app. They just changed it to a subscription, but that's the way our world is these days. Um, but you can do um, it's got a tremendous macro feature built in. So even if you don't have a, an iPhone with macro control, um, the macro mode in Camera Plus Pro Camera and Editor is amazing. Um, and then it, you have the ability, um, I use the Camera Plus Pro Camera and Editor for infrared photography because I can set my white balance to 1500 Kelvin or 1400 Kelvin, and I can do 30 second shooting period. And the tonality I get with that particular app, I don't know what it does differently, but I really love the result with that. So that's that's another Tremendous, uh, tremendous tool. Whoever asked me that question, if you want to email me, I'll send you another document that I have that has a, a list of other apps that I that I enjoy using with the iPhone. And one last question about the phone itself: Do you use any flash setups with your phone? Charlie Gibson was asking that. Um, I did. I used to, and the one I used to use no longer functions. Um, I I haven't looked at it recently to to see. I don't use the flash that's built. <laughs> Excuse me. Pardon me. I don't use the um, the flash that's built into the camera because it's one harsh blast that you can't regulate and it's on the camera facing directly at the subject. So you can't move it off camera and, and have an angle for your flash. 
but there there may be new um, flash setups today that I have not um, that I haven't explored recently. The one I used to use, um, uh, I'm see if I can tell you what it was. Um, Pro Photo had a system that I used for a while, but um, it the app that they had for it is no longer supported, so you can't really use it. Um, but that's not to say there might not be something new that I'm not aware of. Thanks. Well, let's let's go on to your next part about the phone itself. Okay. So what I'm going to do here, um, I'm going to share my camera here. And um, so just to be clear, what we're talking about is this camera right here. It's the camera that comes with the phone, the native camera. And that's where I'm going to take us into right now. And if I tap on it, open it up, I've, I've got this, uh, I'm just pointing at a little studio setup that I have here with a few items on my desktop. And I'm just going to walk around the interface here and um, show you what my settings are and, and talk about these different features. So you'll notice the first thing that you see up here in the upper left is the flash icon. And you'll notice I have it turned off. I, I just mentioned why I don't use it. It's a harsh blast. You can't con you know, control it. You can't uh, move it. Um, it's not the best angle uh, to your subject. So I don't I don't use it unless I'm trying to get the serial number off the washer in the basement. You know what I mean? It's not anything I use for any artistic endeavors. Um, the next thing that you, that I see on my camera, and you might see something different depending on the light you're sitting in right now and depending on the camera you have. This is an exposure dial. And if you tap on that, it's a button. So if I tap on it, it brings up a slider down at the bottom. And you notice it's set to zero right now, but I can slide it to the left and drop my exposure down to 1x. Or I can go back to zero and I can slide and brighten things by two, by, uh, two stops. So typically what I do is leave this set to zero um, unless I'm doing night photography and I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, I usually leave it set to zero. The other way to manage your um, exposure and focal point is to tap on the screen. So if you don't tap on the screen to show the camera where you want to focus and where you want to get a light reading, it's going to make something up. But so if I want to focus on the camera here, I'm going to tap right there. Notice the little box that appears around that. Um, so if I tap on that, there's I can take my finger and drag up and I can brighten the exposure that way, or I can drag down and I can I can darken the exposure. The other so thing that I can do here, the box. I, pardon me? You drag within the box. You don't have to, you can drag anywhere on the screen. So I'm just dragging elsewhere, like I'm over here with my finger dragging okay. up and down. You just tap and you drag. The other thing you can do is hold your finger on that spot and it see it jiggle. Now I've auto folk, I've got a I've locked a focus and exposure point right here. Now I can now I can change my my exposure by dialing up and down. So typically what I do, and, and I don't know, you guys may have a better idea about this. I I expose for the brightest parts in the image. The reason I do that is because if I if I expose for the darker areas, I may be blowing out my highlights. And as you know, you can't really recover the highlights if there's no data there. So I will expose for the bright area in the image. And then if my shadows are too dark, I can lift those in my processing software. Um, so if I need to though, I will go back I'll set my focus here on the desktop by sliding up and down, but then I will go back occasionally to this. So for example, I learned that when I'm doing night photography, like the, the stars that I showed you with the cypress trees, when I photograph that, I drop this value, I tapped on that and I dropped that value down to minus two. When I did the ambient light from the city that was interfering with my night sky virtually disappeared. And my, the stars just popped out of that black sky. And that was something I, I learned by just accident uh, in exploring that. So it's just, you've got these two different ways of adjusting of adjusting your exposure. 
um, and then locking it down, just like with your big camera, if you lock your exposure, you can move around, you can take different photographs and the co camera doesn't have to constantly recalculate um, your exposure point um, and focal point. Um, so the, the next thing, and I, I know I'm going fast here, but remember you, you can access this video. Um, the other thing that you may not see, or you may, um, there is a night mode icon that usually appears right here where I'm pointing. Well, it's not appearing there right now because it's light enough in the studio area where I am that it's not activating. But watch when I turn off my light. And let me turn off the other one. Come on. Okay. As soon as I've got a low light situation, now I have this little capsule up here. That's night mode activating. And it's telling me it's going to give me a two second excuse me, shooting period. Now I can come down here. I can set my focus the way I've always done. I could even drop my, 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 my highlights down a little bit if I want to. Now, when I make this photo, I'm going to tap the shutter button and it runs for two seconds. And if I go out and look at the photo, there it is. And I mean, I'm sitting here almost in the dark excuse me and that's a relatively noise free image considering it's almost completely dark in here um and if it were a little darker i would be able to get a longer exposure um so if i if you ever are in a dark situation and you don't see this capsule or maybe you see this the night mode icon with a line through it indicating that it's not active. Open this parrot right here and down at the bottom, you'll have the night mode icon right here. Now it's showing that it's, it's off, but if you tap on it, you get a dial. Well, it's showing us that it's off right now, but if I slide it, I can move it to auto and notice it's now giving me a two second exposure, but I can also move it further to max. And now it's giving me a little bit longer exposure. So when you're doing night photography or when you're doing infrared photography, you want, you want this activated and you want it to be at the maximum amount of time so that it's taking a, a more, more photographs to stack together. Um, so if I turn this away from that bright light of the of that fountain, it should, no, it's not, I don't know why. It should be giving us a little, yeah. So now it's giving us a five second period uh, because it's darker than, than pointing at, you know, if I move over here to where this light is, now it's just gonna give us less, uh, less time. It's gonna have, it goes down to three. So the darker it is, um, the, the more uh, seconds you're going to get. You can handhold this up to 10 seconds and it's remarkably forgiving, which you wouldn't expect it to be, but it is. Um, anything beyond 10 seconds, you have to have it on a tripod. The gyroscope in the phone um, clues the, the computer into knowing that it's being held by a human. <laughs> and so it won't allow more than 10 seconds when it's handheld. But you put this on a tripod in a very dark situation, like the night shot that I showed you, you're going to get up to 30 seconds. Um, and th that's where your night mode starts to really shine. Um, if you ever don't want it, you just simply tap to turn it off. But watch what happens when I turn my lights back on and brighten my scene. It, it, it... Oh, there, there it goes. It goes away. So once it acclimates to the bright light, it's like, hey, we don't need night mode. It's it's too bright. We don't need it. Um, so so that's that's that. It's a little weird, I think. I, I wish it operated a little differently, but um, knowing that you can go in here and find that button and turn it on manually is useful. Um, as we move across here, you'll notice um, the next thing that you see up here. Uh, is mine says raw max, which is what you see with the 15. Uh, if you have an earlier phone, it may say pro raw. If you don't see that, 
it means either you have a phone earlier than the 12 or you don't have a pro model phone that, that has uh, raw with it, or you simply haven't turned it on in your camera settings. In order to see this button on your interface, it has to be turned on in camera settings. So we're gonna look at that in a second. There are two things in addition to the raw button, there is also something known as a macro control. And that also you have to turn on in your settings in order to see the button on the screen. So I wanna show you both of these right here and then we'll go into the settings and I'll show you where to set those. But if I take, take my little elephant here and I move it close to the screen. Notice as I move closer, you see that little flower that appeared down in the lower corner? That's macro mode, but it's off. So I, I can get as close as I want, but it's not going to focus on it because macro mode is off. But watch what happens when I tap that flower and turn it on. Now, I need some light. Now, look how close I can get to this thing. I mean, I'm practically touching the lens. And now I can take that photo. Ah. And there's our, there's our phone. I've kind of moved it. I'm not doing a very good job because I'm hand holding this little item here in my hand. Um, but as I get closer, take the photo. And there's my macro shot. I mean, that's pretty darn good. Um, and, but in order to see that button, you have to go into your settings and turn it on. So that's what I'm going to do right now. Um, I'm going to go into my camera settings. So to do that, I'm just going to go out here to the settings for the phone. And, you know, here's your settings. Here's where you usually come into. Well, you have to scroll all the way down until you come to camera right here. When I tap on camera, you can come in here and the first thing you're going to do is just scroll to the bottom of this first screen and you'll see macro control. Now, this is on the 13 and after, and it has to be the 13 Pro or Pro Max. If you've got like the, the 15 Plus or something, I'm not sure macro control is, is in those. those. Those other phones are really not photographer's phones, so you may not have all these features. Turn that on. When you turn that on, it doesn't mean that you're going to shoot everything in macro. It simply means that you're activating the button on the interface of your camera so you can turn macro on and off. The other thing you want to do is go into formats right here. And if you tap on formats, um, you notice the first thing you have is a choice between something called high efficiency HEIF format or most compatible. Well, most compatible is going to be a JPEG and it's a, I believe it's an eight bit lossy file. So the more you work with that JPEG, the more it degrades. The high efficiency is a more contemporary file format. I believe it's 11 bit and it has more data and takes up less space than a JPEG. I love this format. I think I get better quality results with this format. Um, short of shooting raw. So raw is the, gonna give me the best result in my opinion, but high efficiency is right behind it. And the high efficiency is a really small file size. So if that's an issue for you, um, it's not gonna take up a lot of space like a raw file does. So the next thing that you wanna do is come down here to pro resolution control. You wanna turn that on so it's green and you, it will activate this choice right here. Tap on that. And you can choose between a 48 megapixel HEIF file, a 12 megapixel RAW, or a 48 megapixel RAW. It doesn't really matter, excuse me, what you select here. And the reason I say that, and we're going to go look at this in a minute, there is a button on the camera interface that lets you toggle between these three. So you don't, it doesn't really matter. You can set it to any one of these. I set it for uh, Pro Max 48. If I'm going to shoot RAW, I want the highest megapixel count I can get. You're going to get that when you use the 1X main camera on your phone. That's the one that's going to give you 48 megapixels. And you can see down here the file sizes um, for a, a, it's going to be about 75 megabytes for a Pro Raw 
48 megapixel file. It's 25 for a 12 megapixel RAW, but it's only five megapixels for that 48 megapixel 8-bit heat file, which or 11-bit heat file, which is pretty cool. Um, so, so I'm going to go back to the camera interface, and here's the interface. And notice right now, Pro Max is on. So when I'm shooting in the 1x camera, and I take a Pro Max file uh, photo, let me go ahead and just do that. I'm going to tap for focus. I'll take my photograph. I'm I'm set to the main camera and Max. When I take the photo and then go look at the photo in the camera roll, I can swipe up on the image and see the metadata. And it shows me it's a raw file, it's a 48 megapixel file, and it takes up 62.6 .6 megabytes of space. So it's a big honking file, um, but it's got that, that resolution uh, too. So here's the thing you don't have to shoot everything in raw and it's very easy to turn this off. So if I tap here, I'm gonna turn off raw. Now, if I take a photograph with raw off, I'll just do it. We'll go look at this. I'm gonna swipe up. Notice now it defaulted to my option of Heath. It's giving me a 24 megapixel file. It hasn't yet calculated the megabytes. So if I drop this down and do it again, now we see that it's a 2.6 megabyte file, but a 24 megapixel resolution. Pretty cool. So here's the other thing. When you're in your camera, this is actually a button. And if you hold your finger on that button, you can choose between a 48 megapixel heat file, a 12 megapixel raw, or a 48 megapixel raw. So you don't have to go back to your settings. You can do it all right here. So lots of different options for us. Um, the, the key thing to, th to remember is that if you are gonna shoot raw, which I do all the time now, it's gonna take up more space. So you're gonna be investing in more cloud storage or you're gonna be uh, filling your hard drives uh, because those files are gonna take up a lot more space than a JPEG or a HEAP file. Um, but a good alternative, I think, is the 48 megapixel HEAP file, which is not anywhere near the size of the raw. Okay. So moving on here, um, the, a couple other things about the native camera um, that I'll just mention, um, and some of this I'm sure many of you are aware of this already, but um, you wanna make sure that when you choose a, fill, a, a camera lens, you choose one of the ones that are listed here, either the 13, the 24, uh, I think it's the 48, and then the 120. You wanna choose one of these because that's gonna give you an optical zoom. It's using the glass in the camera that, and so you're you're gonna get the best quality image. So the best thing is to use one of these, zoom with your feet if you need to, walk closer to your subject. What you wanna avoid doing is taking two fingers and pinching to zoom. You can do it, but when you do that, you're switching to an optical zoom which is basically the equivalent of taking a photograph and blowing it up and trying to print it um, bigger than it would print. It's gonna look all pixelated. It's just gonna look funky. Um, that's not to say don't ever do it. Um, you, you may do it for certain things, um, but know that if you do that, you're creating an image that may have some integrity issues that you may need to address in some other ways, like maybe Photoshop or uh, photo, uh, uh, photo AI or something from Topaz. Um, so the other thing that you can do here that I would recommend you avoid, you can take the dial and you can dial into 25X. It goes out, that's like um, 600, over 600 millimeter. Um, you can do that, but you're going to get a very poor quality photo. <laughs> so I try and avoid those things unless it's absolutely necessary. You know, I tell people, if you see uh, Sasquatch riding a unicorn under a rainbow at 500 yards, you zoom into 600 and you get the shot. Maybe that's why all the pictures of Sasquatch are blurry. I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, th that's one of the, the tips that I wanted to, to give you. The other thing is, um, there are some other things you can do with the native camera here that might come in useful. For example, 
let's say you're photographing um, a volleyball game and you want to get a, a shot of the player spiking the ball at the top of the net. Well, that can be a very challenging photo to time correctly. So one thing to do is do a burst of photos. And the burst photo, it's going to give you a, bit, a little bit lesser quality image in terms of megapixels, but it allows you to get that shot. So the way to do that, <laughs> so I'm going to do this, change this to 2x just to be a little closer. I'll focus here on my, on my elephant. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the shutter button right here and drag it to the left and hold it down. As long as I hold it down, it's going to fire. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to hear this or not, but see if you can. So here we go. I just took 41 photographs in the time that it took to, to do that. If we go in and look at the photo here, it's going to tell us that we took 41, excuse me, 41 photos. Well, one of those is going to be the player spiking the ball at the top of the net, very likely. Um, if we go down here, we can unpack those 41 photos. So if I tap select, here are all the photos. And you can scroll through them, and it, it looks like the flip books we had as kids. Whoops. Um, you, you can see all the different photos. Um, you find the one you want. Say, that's our money shot right there. You're going to tap to select it. And when you do it, it marks it with a check mark. You can select multiple files if you want, or you just don't want. And then when you come up and say done, it's going to let you, it asks you, do you want to keep only the one you selected? Or do you want to pull that one out but and keep everything uh, still? In this case, I'm going to say throw everything else away and I only want that one photo. So I'll click on that. And now there's that one photo and I can now go process that and however I want. If I swipe up on this and look at the metadata, notice it's a JPEG. It defaults to JPEG. Even though I had HEIC as my alternate, it still goes to JPEG and it's 12 megapixels. So there are limitations to this, but you still have that opportunity to, to get that money shot in a way that, that can work. Um, let's see. Um, one other thing that's pretty cool um, that I use a lot when I'm photographing dancers in Cuba, a lot of times the dancers will go through a like a motion um, leading up to a leap or whatever. And I like to get a video of them going through that dance move. Well, you can actually do a video and take stills at the same time. I know it's bizarre, but here's what we're going to do. So here's our, our, our dancer, that beautiful elephant there. I'm going to I'm going to lock my focus on him. Now I'm going to take the shutter button and I'm going to drag it to the right and I can release it. I'm going to take it and drag it to the right and release it. And look, the video camera is now running. It's making a video of my elephant doing whatever it's going to do. But I can also come over here and tap the shutter button while the video is running. So there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. I just took four stills while the video is running. If I tap on the, the red button here, it turns off the video. <laughs> Excuse me. And now I'm going to go to the camera roll. There's my 26 second video that we just did. And these are the stills that I made while the video was running. Now, if we take a look at one of those and swipe up on it, notice it's only 10 megapixels and it's a JPEG. So it is a lower resolution image, but still 10 megapixels is 10 megapixels. And you can do a lot with that photo, especially if you make some accommodations or use something like photo AI. So it's just a great option um, that might allow you to get a photograph that would be very challenging to get uh, under other circumstances. Um, let's go back here. So the next thing that I wanted to, to talk about here um, is portrait mode. And for that, I'm going to bring my little frog over here. And I'm going to switch to portrait mode down here. Tap on it. And there we are. Um, we're in portrait mode. Now you can choose any of the cameras that are available. When I tap on this, I can choose 1X, 2X, or 5X. 
I'm going to leave it on 2x for this demonstration, but you could use any of them. Also, when you take a portrait mode, there are a couple other things you could set at the time you make the photo, but I'm going to suggest that you don't. You wait. You could change the f-stop from f16 all the way down to 1.4. This is a simulated f-stop. There is no aperture on the iPhone, but it's simulating the aperture on a big camera. So if we're at 1.4, that aperture is going to be very big and we're going to have a very shallow depth of field. At f16, the aperture is much smaller and more of the uh, focal length is going to be in focus um, from front to back. So what I recommend, don't even worry about doing that. The other thing you can do is choose a light mode <laughs> down here. Don't worry about it. You can set both of those after you've made the photo and it's so much easier. What you're going to do, the main thing that's important is that you make sure portrait mode is active. Notice how natural light is grayed out. That's telling me portrait mode isn't active yet. And it's telling me to move further away from the subject. So I'm gonna move back and I'm gonna just keep tapping my subject there. Now it activated. Portrait mode is now active. So when I make this photo, it's going to create a depth map of that image. And then I can do the editing later. So watch what happens. Let me just move this just a little bit, separate it from some stuff there. And there's our image. Tap on it. I can set my exposure if I want. Maybe drop that down, a little drama for a frog. And now I'm going to tap the shutter button and boom, it just made the portrait mode. Now let's go look at it in the camera roll. It tells me it was made with portrait mode. And now I can go into the iOS editor right here. And it takes me into the portrait section of the iOS editor. So notice it's set at F16. So pretty much no, everything is in as much focus as it's going to get from front to back. This is still pretty soft, but it's because we're with at a, at a 48 millimeter lens. So what I can do now, I can take my finger and drop this down and look what happens. I'm actually opening the aperture, simulated aperture, and look how the black background is getting softer and softer. I can go all the way down to 1.4. Now look at our image. Our frog is really in focus only on the eye and the mouth there. I could open it up a little bit and allow more of the background to show. So you get to decide, you have the creative judgment here about what you want to do. The other thing you can do is come up here to this icon and this is gonna allow you to change the light. So if I tap on that, I have all these different options down here. This first one is natural light. If I slide to the next one, that's studio light. Look out, see how it brightens the frog just a little. There's contour light. Um, so you can choose between those three, but then you can go to stage light and watch this. Now we've got a spotlight on the frog. What's cool about it is at any of those light modes, you still have a slider down here and you can slide to the left and darken the image or you can slide to the right and brighten it up. So I'm gonna look for that sweet spot that's giving me the exposure that I want on these highlights. The other thing I can do is switch back to my f-stop slider and I can, I'm at f6, 5.6 right now, but I can, I can drop that down and have a really tight spotlight on the frog or I can open it up. If I go all the way, I'm giving, I'm putting background uh, behind the frog, but I can drop it down a little bit maybe to something like that. And now I've got um, a little bit more context, just a little. So these are just creative options that you have. Once you've got it the way you want it, you could always go into the other adjustments for the image, tap here. You can do an auto adjustment. You could do any of these other exposure, brilliance, shadows, all the things that you might do with any image um, and further edit it. And then when you, when you're finished, you would say done. And there's your image. Now it's still a portrait photo. And if you want, you can revert it back to the original. You're just gonna come down to edit, tap on edit. And you notice the revert button up here. When you tap revert, it 
asks you if you want to revert it to the original and I'll say yes. And now it's just going to put it back in the camera roll in its original portrait uh, mode. So the, the main thing that I want to stress here is that the most important thing with this is to make sure that you activate portrait mode. If you don't have this yellow, it's not going to create a depth map and you're just going to get a flat fo regular photo. That's the most important thing. The other stuff you can do after the fact. And I think it's easier to do it after the fact than to try and set up your photo before you make it um, with all the lighting and the f-stop. Um, what's really interesting though, okay, let's look at this. So let's put the frog there and the elephant here. And I'm gonna put the elephant a little bit behind and I'm gonna focus on the frog and I'm gonna make this photograph. I've got uh, portrait mode is active. I'm gonna tap to make the photo. Well, watch this. I'm gonna go and do, go into the portrait editor and I could drop this down, blur everything. What? Watch what happens when I tap on the elephant. I just changed the focal point to the to the elephant from the frog. What if I tap on the the marbles in the background? Now I'm focused on the marbles. Now they aren't real sharp, but you see what's happening. It's using that depth map that was created and allowing you to select points along that depth map. Um, to focus on, um, focus on right on the edge of the, the box if we want it. So a lot of creative opportunity here with this tool. Um, all right. Let's see, how are we doing on time here? So uh, we're getting close to the, the end of our time. I do want to show you just one other thing real quickly. Um, um, I don't think we did. I I do want to show you um, back to here. I do want to show you live mode. So live mode. Um, did we do this already? I don't think I showed you this. Did we? Did I? You guys hear me? No, I don't think you did. No. Nope. Okay. So what I'm going to do, what I want to do, live mode is the one that's going to allow you to get a, a soft waterfall. So here's our here's our live mode up here. Watch what happens. Notice raw is on, but watch what happens when I turn on live mode. It flashes live and it turned off pro raw. So you can't get a raw file in live mode. It's going to give you, uh, I believe, a JPEG, maybe a heath, but I think a JPEG. So what's going to happen here? I'm going to tap for focus. I can even lock on that if I want. I'm going to drop my exposure down, kind of add a little drama to our scene. And now I'm going to take the photo and watch up here. It's going to flash live. So there, it just took the live photo. Now let's go look at it in the camera roll. It tells me it's a live photo. If I tap on live, I get a pick list. I could do a loop. Watch what happens. If I do a loop, it's just going to run continuously. Not sure what we'd use that for, but you can but if I come down to long exposure and tap long exposure, it's going to soften all the moving water, but leave everything else sharp. So this is that tool that's going to let us get these incredible um, handheld long exposure. So let's go look at some of these in real life. I know my little demonstrations a little lacking in terms of what you can do, but look at these. And these were all done with uh, with different excuse me, different cameras. Uh, this one was the 10S Max. It's a live photo. I go to live and I choose long exposure and look at what I get. I mean, that's beautiful. Uh, and it's handheld with no uh, tripod. If I go to this one, this is out on Cape Cod, this pier, choose long exposure. And look at that. You get this ethereal, misty looking um, uh a long exposure. Um, and it, you can go on and on. There's lots of different ones here. Um, uh, show you a couple back here. We looked at that one already. This is one, and Kevin and I have almost the same photo. I think his is better. We stood next to each other when we made this photo, and this was with the live mode in the Palouse. 
um, once you make the photo, then you can process it and do what you want to. And that, this was my version. I think, Kevin, you used something called reheld or reflex uh, or no, it was a different, a different. No, it was reflex. It was reflex. OK. And I think your your image um, is better than That's what I, got. I, I was able to go a longer exposure. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's just really cool what you can do with that app. Um, with that tool. So um, let's see. So that's, that's live mode. One thing about live mode to keep in mind when it's, when it does that, um, when it does the, the live mode, it crops the image a little bit. So you want to allow yourself a little bit of room around the edges because it can crop into your frame more than you want. So um, you'll discover that the hard way, like I did, um, but just leave yourself room around the uh, the frame so that it can then take in a, a, a few pixels uh, on the long and short side of the image. Um, the, the last thing with the camera that I wanted to mention is is portrait mode, or I mean pano mode. And the pano mode, I, I love this tool for creating um, panoramas of landscapes and also interiors. Um, if uh, to do the panos, you basically follow the instructions that are on the screen. You have an arrow and a yellow line, and you have this thumbnail in here, and it tells you to move the phone continuously when taking a panorama. So you don't have to look at the thumbnail. The top edge here is the top edge here. The bottom edge here is the bottom edge here. So just look at the whole phone to frame your shot. And then when you're ready to go, you're just going to tap the shutter button and you can release it. You don't have to hold it down. Just tap and then start to move. And you want to keep the arrow on the line. Now it's telling me to slow down because I'm in a low light situation. When you get to the end of what you want to shoot, you reverse motion. Excuse me. You reverse motion and it shuts off. If you want to shoot from the other direction, instead of this direction, you just tap on the opposite side of the frame and it reverses the arrow. And then right now I have my camera in a, um, a vertical position and it's gonna give me a horizontal panorama. But if I turn my phone into a horizontal position and move the phone up, I'm gonna get a vertical pano. So let's just go look at a couple of these just to give you an idea of what they, what they look like um, when you do these. And there's a variety of them here. And again, these were taken with a variety of different cameras over the years. This, this shows the kind of barrel distortion you get. This is a church in Ohio and those pews are not bent, but the barrel distortion, because I'm so close to the subject and that will change depending on the lens you choose uh, when you take the photo, whether it's the ultra wide or the 120 millimeter. This is one of those vertical panos I'm talking about where I turn the phone in a different way and I and I pan up and it, it you know this is out in the Palouse to show the vastness of those roads and the sky. I couldn't have made this photo with any different I mean a wide angle wouldn't do it. Um it the pano is going to give me that kind of look. Um this was done in Tropeo um in southern Italy. I mean what a wonderful way to show this scene um with a pano and I don't know if you can see this this thing is pristine. I mean, I, I've printed this really large and it's beautiful. Um, here's another little tip. So this is also in Southern Italy. When you do a pano, let's say you're doing a landscape like this one, find the brightest area in the, in the frame and hold your finger down on it until it locks the exposure on that spot. When it does, it'll prevent the camera from recalculating as you move through the scene. If you don't do that, you might get lines through your scene that uh, that are that show the different um, exposures. When you do that, the darker areas like this might be darker than you would like, but you'll be exposed properly for the highlights. You can always lift the shadows in your processing, but you can't recover blown out highlights. So that's a little tip um, that, I, that I recommend. Here's another of the vertical panos where you, um, do, turn your phone on the side and do a vertical pano and you can get that beautiful floor, the altar, the ceiling, all of those details included in uh, in one photo.
Um, well, that's those are the main things that I wanted to share about the camera. I know we're probably getting close to the end of our time here. Um, I'm happy to field questions or uh, if there's anything else you'd like to see, I'm happy to share what I can. So um, uh, do we have any other questions? At this I'm point? looking in the chat. Uh, we don't, but everybody can unmute their microphone if they would like to ask any particular question. Yeah, I got a question. Yeah, Jeff. So I've got a uh, 15 Pro with a terabyte and I've got 50 gigabytes left on my phone after this trip to uh, Portugal. Because um, I do have this propensity for shooting raw because being able to get a 48 megapixel raw capture is just too enticing. Um, and I know Kevin uses uh, the, cl uh, the cloud. I just have never done that with Apple. I also don't use Apple Photos. Um, but I got to do something because I can't put more. Well, I guess they're coming out with two terabyte. Uh, <laughs> every time the, I get a phone, yeah. I get the next bigger size. So. I, I understand. Well, I do what Kevin does. I use, I use both Adobe cloud stuff and I use iCloud. Um, but there are some options that we have, um, with the, the phone. You can now get, um, let's see if I can find this. Give me one second. I'm running over the other side of the room um, and show you this thing. It's a thumb drive that you can plug in. Okay, here it is. You have to unshare your screen, Rad, so we can see you. Oh. Or uh, stop your sh your screen sharing. Oh, okay. There I am. Okay, so... Um, what I'm getting is this little tiny deal, and it's by Sandisk. It's a little tiny thumb drive. That's a USB-C um, attachment on it. And you can plug this into your phone. And I don't know, I think this is a terabyte. I don't know, it's a lot of storage space. I can't remember how much. And you can download your images directly to this thumb drive um, and secure them elsewhere and then delete them from your phone. Um, because it's USB-C, it's very fast now. It also, if you turn, oh wait, no, this doesn't have, it. they make them that have both a, a, a lightning adapter and a USB-C, uh, uh, USB-C adapter. Um, but that's one way. And, and then, um, you can, you know, store them that way. You can, um, if you're using, are you using a Mac? Yeah. Well, oh, duh. <laughs> so, well, I don't know. I never know. If you're using a Mac, the other thing you can do is take your phone, plug it into your Mac. There's software that's shipped with your Mac called uh, Photo Capture. Are you familiar with it? You mean Image Capture? I mean Image Capture. Yeah. 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 So you could, you, the Image Capture will read your phone as if it was a hard drive or a card. Just, just use the Apple iCloud, Jeff. You know, we. Start something new. You made me move the Lightroom. You can move to the cloud. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm thinking I, I got to do that because um, the thing about it is that I like keeping everything on my phone. I like access to everything because I got 40,000 images. I, I you never can still access them. Yeah, I know. Well, not if I take them off and delete them. So. No, well, don't delete. No, you can still leave them on there. Just leave the proxy. Yeah. It, uh, you and I have to have a talk. Okay. All right. So I've, I've got a 13 Pro. I guess cloud. it's worth upgrading um, at some point. I'm sorry? I've got a 13 Pro. It's worth upgrading at some point. Maybe oh, I'll yeah, start. John. Holy cow, you can't be that far behind. You know, I mean, it really depends on what you want to do. The 13 Pro is still an amazing tool. It's just not as advanced as the 14 and not as advanced as the 15. You've got features on those two phones that are that surpass the 13. So, well, we're a little over ninety minutes. Well, yeah, know. we we went a lot. We went. That was it. Was a good, good, good program, though. I told you I was long winded, Kevin. Sorry. Well, I know you're long winded. That's why you and I drive around together, and you know <laughs> you can be as long winded as you want. 
I didn't think it was long winded at all. It was no, it was very good presentation. You moved it very fast, professionally done. Rad, you get a 10. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what we'll do is nobody else has anything. Let me at least stop the recording and then we can just stay in line and, and chit chat for a second if anybody wants to. Um, that way we can get the recording down and uh, make it something that everybody can reach. So I'm going to stop the recording and we can still then just have a chit chat here. We'll